Howdy, folks. Let's make sure the uh, stream is going okay. Yep, looks like it's going out in the right direction and everything. Good morning. Well, it's coming to the end of the morning here. It's about uh, 11 a.m. in downtown San Diego, California. Uh, so trying out a brand new theme on Twitch today, or my, on all my streaming platforms, a brand new set of overlays uh, with new chat displays, new webcam frames, all of that. So looking forward to playing around with this and seeing what y'all think of it too as well. Uh, so it's a little twist from the black and white thing that I've had before. Now your chat shows up larger too as well. Uh, so it makes it a little bit easier for folks to read on their phones and their iPads and all that good stuff to see what folks are saying and follow along. So in this morning's session, let me switch over and show that. So let's switch over to here and show my PowerPoint. So in this morning session, I'm going to be repeating a webcast that I just did for Quest Software. Just like an hour ago, I did this exact same session for Quest Software, and I wanted to get it out to y'all too as well, out on the streaming channels, because there were a lot of good questions in, in the private streaming webcast too as well. Ah, Penal, is a very kind guy. Uh, Prahlad says, will this be available as a recorded session later? Yes, absolutely. This The same place that you're watching it here, so you in your case, you're watching it on Facebook, you can see it right in this exact same URL, so you can bookmark it, come back to it later, etc. And all these just stay up, and I don't take them down or anything like that. You can also catch them on my YouTube channel, my Twitch channel, uh, Mixer, all those places. So today, uh, Ch Charka, oh, one of the first DBAs I ever met. Charka, good to see you there, sir. Woo. Charka is one of the reasons I first got into database administration. So take a bow there, Charka, good to see you. Um, so today, let's talk about the top three pit, uh, uh, pitfalls of managing your costs up in Azure SQL DB. And what I'm going to talk about is why monitoring platform as a service is so totally different than monitoring infrastructure as a service. Uh, the limits aren't clearly documented, and often when they are, the limits are incorrect in the documentation. You'll hit limits that you didn't even expect. Um, how you can end up tuning the wrong bottleneck and ruining your ROI, wasting time, and it looks like you didn't actually do anything. So the first thing that we'll talk about is the thing that gets database administrators and systems administrators so confused. We're very used to monitoring physical servers and VMs, things that are dedicated to us. We use things like the plan cache, weight statistics, perfmon counters. I'm not going to explain how to do that inside this session. If you want to see more about it, go to brentozar.com slash go slash database days, where I did a one hour session for Quest talking about how you measure SQL servers. You can go click on the box for that webcast and go walk, watch it right away. But everything that I talked about inside that webcast is only true when the data's there every time we go to look for it. Which sounds obvious, why wouldn't the data be there? But the problem is, is that weight stats data, plan cache data, index usage data, none of that sticks around when you switch over to platform as a service. So for a second, <coughs> excuse me, I got asthma so I cough, so it's immediately people are like, ah! But so we need to talk for a second about the difference between Azure Infrastructure as a Service uh, versus Platform as a Service. With Infrastructure as a Service, it's just VMs. You manage the backups, the patching, the high availability, the disaster recovery. So if something failed over, it's because you did it. You know when the plan cache is going to clear out. You know when wait stats are going to clear out. But with Platform as a Service, that's not necessarily the case. With platform as a service, whether we're talking about Azure SQL DB, Amazon RDS, or Google Cloud SQL, someone else manages all this stuff. So someone else is involved with the failovers, the patching. And if for a second, let's imagine that you were managing the high availability and disaster recovery for that cloud provider. If you know that you're dealing with dozens or hundreds of databases for each individual client, and if you know that the client is never going to come to you and say, oh, hey, it's totally okay if you fail over my server right now, 
what you would do is you would build logic that would watch how busy these servers are and you would automatically do your failovers and patching when you had like 30 to 60 seconds of idle time when nothing was going on on that database for 30 to 60 to 90 seconds. And you would leap in there and take that whenever you could because, of course, uptime is different for different businesses. Different businesses have different peaks and valleys when they go get lots of workloads. So infrastructure as a service is really a lot like having a sysadmin at your beck and call. The sysadmin will build things with you. The sysadmin will let you do all kinds of crazy stuff in your SQL server. You can even mix and match cloud providers. You can go from high availability from on-premises over up to somebody else's clouds. You can mix and match clouds, any kind of wild and crazy stuff that you want to do. Because in infrastructure as a service, you're just hiring someone else to build and manage your Windows VMs. You're not actually having them manage the SQL server. So they'll do whatever wacko bad ideas that you have. They'll let you run old versions of SQL server, old versions of Windows, things that are completely unsupported because really all they're doing is handling the plumbing for you. Platform as a service is different. With platform as a service, you're essentially outsourcing the DBA role. And you know what they say about DBA, don't bother asking. Well, you know how you would always come in and say, well, someone wants to come in and say, hey, I'd, I'd like to use SQL Server 7. You would give them the finger. You know, you just wouldn't stand for that kind of thing. Well, that's what platform as a service is. Platform as a service is someone else giving you the finger. Someone at platform as a service is someone else dictating how you're going to manage high availability and disaster recovery. And there are no negotiations. It's their way or the highway. And I know a lot of database administrators who look at platform as a service and they're like, man, I wish I could just force my users to let me let me uh, take the server down in the middle of the day. For example, with Amazon RDS, you get to pick a one hour window each week where your database server will undergo maintenance and patching. You don't get to say you don't get a window. You just get to pick what window it is. You get to pick which hour it is, but you're going to have one. It's not negotiable. Oh, I would have loved to have been able to do that as a database administrator. That would have been the coolest thing. But people like you and I, we have a really hard time with that, with things that are up here on the screen. Because platform as a service isn't meant for us. Infrastructure as a service is really meant for us. Infrastru if infrastructure as a service is for those of us who say, I want to put in all kinds of unsupported features and I'm going to manage it myself because I'm real smart, which may or may not be true. Platform as a service is for someone else. Platform as a service is for people who are willing to put their data in someone else's cloud, people who are willing to put their app servers up there. And it's really best for companies that specialize in development. Companies, code exploit says, so are our DBA days counted? Are we going to be forgotten in the sunset? No, and you'll see why during the course of this session. That right-hand side there, this platform as a service is really meant for companies that are great at development. Companies that have teams of hardcore application developers who never want to hire you anyway. They don't want to hire someone to administer their database. And that's where Code Exploit gets nervous and Code Exploit says, hey, I'm, I'm, are my days numbered? They are until they run out of performance. Because what happens, I'm going to switch uh, gears here for a second. What's happened to me over and over again is that uh, companies have come in and said, oh, I really, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do platform as a service. Just I don't want to hire any database administrators. I'm just going to throw everything up in the cloud and it'll scale automatically. And boom, like uh, Mr. Uh, Mike Shaw says, what happens is that the developers write bad SQL queries or good queries and don't do a good enough job of indexing or they write really ambitious reports or whatever. And the business gets sick and tired of swiping their credit card to pay some big ginormous amount. 
that's where people like us end up coming back in because the costs of doing platform as a service become so spectacular that the business isn't willing to pay all of that. Teja Reb says, what about Azure auto-tuning? Auto-tuning in Azure is the worst name for a feature for what it actually does. All it does is regress plans, query plans, to an earlier version. But if your query never got a good query plan because it's a terrible query, auto-tune it is sitting around going, whoosh, 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 nothing to see here. Azure's automatic tuning for indexes I've written about on my blog as well. It's totally baby steps. It's just absolutely the beginning. It doesn't really do anything near like what you and I would do. So coming back over to the slide decks, this has monitoring implications. Because what's going to happen is these companies are going to come in behind you and go, they're going to come deploy platform as a service. They're going to think that they don't need you. And then they're going to go, oh my God, what happened to our bills? Why are our bills so insanely expensive? And that's where they're going to bring you back in. And unfortunately, this is where everything that you're used to in monitoring won't work. Because someone else is doing the failover. Someone else is clearing wait stats at a time that you can't control. Someone else, Becky says, is he doing this live? Yes, yes, this is live. Hi, Becky. That's Becky on YouTube, Becky B. Um, so wait stats, index DMVs, plan cache, all of this sticks around for hours and weeks on your on-premises services, but not up in the cloud. This stuff can disappear at any given time. And this last line's really important for us. Our homegrown scripts, and I'm including my own, don't produce reliable, accurate results up in the cloud. And I don't care who you're using, whether they're my stuff, like the first responder kit, whether it's Glenberry's diagnostic scripts, the things that you wrote and your predecessor handed you down from years ago, this stuff doesn't work because the contents of the DMVs can disappear at any time with no warning. So when you want to know why the server was slow an hour ago, two hours ago, four hours ago, you can't rely on that data being there. That's why in the readme for the first responder kit for stuff like Alvaro says, I like your merch. Thank you. You're welcome. You can get it over at my Twitch channel too if you go to twitch.tv slash brentozar.com. And I'll put that up in the uh, Slack chat just so that y'all are in the chat so that y'all can go. I'm typing the wrong dang URL. Twitch.tv slash brentozar. You can go get my merch over there. T-shirts, all that kind of coffee mugs, all that stuff. And I'm not actually doing this to promote the merch. It's just that I have a quarantine haircut. So in the readme for this stuff, I'm, I'm totally up front with the first responder kit. I'm like, yo, Azure SQL DB is not supported because Microsoft tends to change the contents of these DMVs without warning. I try to use them as much as I can up in the cloud, but I don't end up keep doing it because the flavors keep changing for Azure SQL DB. Every one of these has a different way of measuring stuff. Eamon says, so how can we do our work as a DBA with all those disappearing stats? Oh, it's worse than that. I'm going to show you even worse than that. <laughs> Hecatron says, I learned the Azure limitations of the first responder kit stuff when I took a job with a primarily Azure SQL DB infrastructure. It was heartbreaking. I feel you, and I wish I had an easy way to fix that. When I first started working with Azure SQL DB, I tried to make all this stuff keep up. I tried to keep my scripts up with every capability, but Every one of these is measured with slightly different ways. And if you go read the documentation, as a side note, I love Microsoft's documentation. They've done a phenomenal job of putting a ton of work into clear, easy to understand documentation. And they even document stuff like internals that I'm, I'm just thankful that they even do it. For example, I personally find Azure SQL DB Hyperscale to be one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I think it's just an amazing engineering effort. I think it's really neat what they're doing under the hood. I think it has a, a brilliant set of legs that's going to take it for the next 10 years in terms of databases if it gets some adoption. That's the trick. But if you look at this infrastructure architecture, oh my god, there's so many things that we want to measure. For example, if you're a traditional DBA, you measure things like how much writes we're doing to the data file or log file and how fast those writes are responding, how fast our storage is, is responding to those requests. 
You simply can't do that here. There's no concept of a, a log file queue or a data file queue up in Azure SQL DB hyperscale because Microsoft has built page servers for the data file, log services for the log file, because they really re-implemented this as more of a microservices piece. Now, so you read the documentation trying to figure out what you're supposed to monitor, and the documentation changes continuously. One of the things I love about Microsoft, they went and bought GitHub, and they've got all their documentation for Azure up there. So you can go and read the documentation in GitHub and make changes. You can make commit requests, for example. There have been 570,000 commits to the Azure docs, which is also where SQL Server lives, up since this thing went live. Five, that's half a million changes. Now, granted, it also includes things bigger than Azure SQL DB, but still, how am, I, how am I supposed to keep up with that? And issues pour in all the time. As of this morning, there were 3,156 issues with the Microsoft documentation. Now, I, I got to be careful when I say that. This is 3,156 people who have reported issues, sometimes they just don't understand the documentation or they want Microsoft to make a change that would benefit themselves. But some of these questions are really legit. For example, this one about a year ago, or I'm sorry, about uh, nine months ago, uh, DC Brown, <laughs> Handy says now it should be 5,000 issues. I uh, keep refreshing and it's probably continuously going up. Oh, I have so much respect for Microsoft documentation people having to deal with folks like you and me and folks like DC Brown here. DC Brown was trying to measure performance for SQL DB managed instances. He's like, I'm running into a problem here. Intelligent insight logs, they don't seem to support certain kinds of information. How do I get IOPS, CPU, and memory from managed instances out of these logs? And then thankfully, fairly quickly, the same day, a Microsoft, or next day, a Microsoft employee came back and said, well, this isn't really what you're looking for. Intelligent Insights, they don't really provide IOPS type stuff. If you want to get IOPS and CPU and memory per instance, you've got to do that through SQL Analytics. And I was like, record scratch, what? SQL what? The ways that you measure things change when you go up to Azure SQL DB or any platform as a service. And the way that you interpret those messages change as Microsoft employee goes on. DC Brown, you're making an assumption that instance level metrics and intelligent insights, JSONs have a relationship. You do not, they do not, you cannot compare those two things, they are not related. JSON is populated with 14 to 15 detectable performance instances, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I love the last line. All this, all available telemetry is already documented, and there is nothing more available to you than what is already stated. Good luck. Thanks. DC Brown goes, no, 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 no. I, I understand that these two things are not the same, these different places that I can get metrics from, from but well, these things don't li line up, and they don't add up. Then he presses for more information, and there hasn't been a reply for over six months. I get it. Microsoft's really busy. They don't have time to deal with every one of us who wants to ask all kinds of interested questions. This is the per first pitfall that you have to deal with when you're trying to measure and monitor services like Azure SQL DB, managed instances, hyperscale, elastic pools, the metrics are kind of sort of there, but it's up to you to put them together. And when you need help, you can get some information from Microsoft, but a lot of times your requests are going to fall on deaf ears because they're really busy. Pitfall number two, even if you're monitoring things, you can run into situations where the limits are either undocumented or they aren't clearly documented. Let me tell you a story. I was working just one day and I get an email from a client. Hey, we're having a problem with our, our uh, stuff up in the cloud. Can you take a look for us? And I always love stuff like that because it, I get to learn the same way that you get to learn, troubleshooting uh, live in a server. And that led to this blog post where I said, how fast can a $21,000 a month Azure SQL DB load data? And the URL's up at the top there, brentozar.com slash go slash slow Azure. And I don't mean that to say that Azure is slow overall. This was just an instance of where the, the server wasn't fast enough for the clients. 
what they would run into is they were trying to mimic the same workloads that they were having in a production environment. And I just said, okay, let me, let me just start by taking the largest possible uh, SQL Server instance up there, Azure SQL DB, that I could buy up in the cloud. Alvaro, I'll get to that question down at the end. I said, let me take the biggest instance that I can possibly get up in the cloud and load data into it as fast as I can, not even from an outside service, just having Azure SQL DB manufacture its own data. And you can kind of get the punchline just from the image on there. When you measure, regardless of how you measure via IOPS, megabytes per second, the latency of how long operations will take, Azure SQL DB, even the fastest one available at the time, was slower than a $30 USB thumb drive. And I wrote this blog post because there wasn't any information out there at the time. The client was hitting a wall thinking that they were doing something wrong, when in reality, just Azure itself. And so then, a few days later, Microsoft acknowledged it. And they said, you know what? Yep, Brent's right. Here it is. Here are the limits. We haven't documented them before, but we'll go ahead and put that in and writing on the documentation page. And for me, the kind of sad stuff was the last line down there. 48 megabytes per second. That's down in USB thumb drive territory. You could buy a cheaper thumb drive off of Amazon or any Best Buy, whoever you want to choose to buy your thumb drives from. And then after enough pressure from customers, after 10 days, they doubled it. Robin Sue was watching the GitHub page for this documentation and told me out on uh, Twitter, hey, they've doubled the uh, throughput, which I'm like, doubled? Well, so it's, and you're going to say, you're about to think that I'm going to say as fast as two USB thumb drives. No, it's still not as fast as one. Now, when you make blog posts like this, other clients end up coming in and talking to you too. They're like, oh, you Brent, you're good at detective work with Azure SQL DB. We have a problem we'd like you to take a look at too. So this other client led to blog on the second blog post, brentozar.com slash go slash slow Azure 2, where business critical Azure SQL DB servers said in the documentation that IOPS would continuously go up as you added more cores. With every set of cores that you added, your transactional throughput in terms of IOPS was supposed to go up. But it didn't. When you got to 16 cores, the IOPS actually stopped and they wouldn't hit the, per the uh, displayed limits. So again, I laid it out in a blog post and Microsoft said, yep, you're right. Turns out that we didn't document that the reads or the IOPS that go up are actually the read IOPS. The write IOPS are fixed as soon as you hit 16 cores. I'm just a guy with a webcam and a blog. I mean, when I discover all of this stuff, Code Exploit says, what about network latency? On premises, there is all one millisecond. Well, so my experience with up in the cloud is that generally cloud latency across areas is pretty good. I sometimes have had some disputable stuff where people thought their on-premises latency was much better than it actually was. So I'm going to hedge my bets on that one. I would want to see your environment before I made any predictions there. And sometimes the problem isn't, uh, isn't uh, inside your own environment. Sometimes the problem is noisy neighbors. For example, I mentioned that the reason I'm wearing this hat is my spiffy quarantine haircut. And uh, we're running into all kinds of stuff. But Annie says, so Microsoft needs someone to remind them of every mistake they made. Well, one I will be fair. I will be fair and say that it's not always mistakes. It's that just as we, when we're developers, we work really hard to get our stuff documented. Oh, no, that's right. You, you hate writing documentation, don't you? You never write any documentation. And I know because I come into y'all's environments and I go, okay, show me the documentation on how this works. And you're like, uh, straightens tie, uh, document, what? Doc Brown? What? Yeah, y'all aren't writing any documentation either. So don't play pin the blame on Microsoft as if it's Microsoft's fault. And you know what? Even when they do write documentation, I'll be damned if y'all read it. You don't. You don't read the documentation. You know how many emails and comments I get on blog posts? Hey, Brent. <laughs> Drop Dable says, your new transitions music is very foreboding. You like that? I'm trying to work on picking out the right one inside there. ST, <laughs> ST Border says, I got code comments. I thought our code was supposed to be self-documenting, right? I thought that was all the documentation that we had to write. 
So like here inside the, uh, the uh, elegance of these quarantines and you know, uh, coronavirus type stuff, we often end up into competition from uh, other people and other companies where there are limits that are published as how many VMs we're supposed to build up, how much, how much Azure SQL DBs we're supposed to be able to spin up. And it turns out that Azure has been having problems with that, just like some of us have been inside our own data centers, where, for example, there were Microsoft MVPs even tweeting about how they used to shut things down every night, but then they, when they went to turn them back on in the morning, they weren't allowed to because Azure had run out of capacity. So am I saying that Azure is bad? Not even close. Azure, Google, Amazon, all cloud providers are essentially in similar problems. They're trying to build things out all of the time. <laughs> Oxen says, the only code comments I see are 2011 temporary fix replaces ASP, or to replace this ASAP. The other thing that I see all the time is proof of concept. This, this stored procedure is only just to get us past the customer's you know, demo, but then after this we'll immediately replace it. Okay. The problem with Azure and with Amazon and Google in our own environments is that we assume that resources are unlimited up in the cloud. We know better than that inside our own data centers. We would never think that we could just spin up as many servers as we want any time that we want. But for some reason, people think it's different up in the cloud. They think that Microsoft or Amazon is going to have unlimited amounts of hardware and so forth. <laughs> Fragrance free Vaseline. Wank, wank. Sure, buddy. So then on to pitfall number three, tuning the wrong bottleneck. So before I do that, I'm going to take a second to do a shout out to our sponsor here. So our sponsor for this week is Quest. Quest Software does monitoring software to, for stuff like Azure SQL DB, managed instances, SQL DB hyperscale. I used to think, uh, back before I became a Microsoft Certified Master, I used to think that uh, automatically uh, every Microsoft Certified Master would be smart enough to write all their own homegrown monitoring scripts and that they would never use third-party off-the-shelf monitoring tools. Oh, hell yeah, they do. They all do because they don't have to... Uh, they don't happen to know how every piece of infrastructure works. I can't keep up with everything that Microsoft does, and that's where Quest Software comes in. They build monitoring tools so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And they have whole teams of people who just try to keep up with the Microsoft documentation and understand what they need from uh, met metric perspectives. Uh, Mac says, who does the drawings of you? Eric Larson. So it's Eric Larson. <laughs> Lost <on> that. <laughs> uh, so that's Eric Larson artwork. So I'm going to type that at Eric Larson artwork.com. Uh, so honey says hello India hi howdy um, so over so our sponsor this week quest software is doing an ask the experts webcast with me and Panal Panal who's also in chat here uh, so if you go to quest.com ask the experts it's a webcast on I believe June 24th where we'll be taking your performance Q&A totally open and you don't even have to be in the live webcast to ask a question if you go over there now and contact us through that you can leave your questions through there and then we'll answer them uh, live on the webcast. We're going to pick our own favorites, of course. We're going to pick our favorites because we get to do those kinds of things. All right, so now coming back over to our regularly scheduled PowerPoint. So pitfall number three is tuning the wrong bottleneck. You're always going to have a list of the top 10 ugliest queries. There are always going to be a really ugly set of workloads on your servers. doesn't matter whether you sort by CPU or by executions or by duration. And knowing which one to focus on is super important. Because up in the cloud, you need to know where your real bottleneck is. Is it CPU? Is it uh, uh, memory grants? Is it reads? So slicing and dicing those becomes super important because every time that you sit down to tune, in my mastering classes, I often use a half hour hourglass. I keep a half hour hourglass on my desk and every time I start tuning, I flip the half hour hourglass. And I wanna make enough measurable process during that half hour that lots of people notice on the server. To me, failure is this sand ticking through and no one noticing that I made a difference. That would suck. Troll Kong, I heard Azure is like an expensive AWS. Yeah, they're all expensive. Ain't nobody going up in the cloud and really saving money. 
So you're always going to have a huge list of expensive queries that you have to deal with. The question becomes, are you spending the right 30 minutes tuning the queries that will reduce your monthly bill overall? And similarly, you're always going to have a list of 10 tables that really suck and really need indexes. What you need to do is you need to focus on whatever your top weight type is during the hours where users care about performance. It's not overnight. It's not when your backups are happening. It's not when CheckDB is happening. It's probably not when the data loads are happening. It's probably not when your index rebuilds are happening. You're specifically worried about the hours and time when your end users are noticing problems. So for that, what you need to do is you need to track your top weight type and then focus on the queries that are causing that weight type. And again, that's where third-party monitoring tools come in so important. I know I write all the first responder kit type stuff. I don't do all the writing. We have a ton of uh, oh, third-party contributors, people who volunteer in the community and write stuff. But I'm saying I'm heavily involved in all of that, and I don't even use this stuff up in Azure SQL DB. I rely on third-party tools because I need something that tracks 24-7 and tells me when there have been changes. Ooh, thank you, Codex Floyd. Thank you. That's wonderful. I appreciate it. Very cool. Uh, so to recap what we covered inside here, you've got three main pitfalls. And unfortunately, some of the times I give you answers in webcasts, and some of the times I just give you questions. In this one, I'm really just giving you questions. The number one pitfall is that monitoring platform as a service is completely different than monitoring infrastructure as a service. Two, the limits aren't clearly documented, and sometimes even when they are documented, documentation's wrong. You have to go in and actually prove it. You have to make your own synthetic workloads that will push it hard enough that you'll be able to test that it's actually true. Ah, thank you, Code Exploit. That's probably exactly what I'm going to do with it, yes. Although not margaritas, because I have the thing, this thing about... I used to work in hotels and restaurants, and uh, these days, if anything has more than like two ingredients, I'm probably not going to make it. I have nothing but respect for professional chefs and bartenders and all that. But uh, no, Hecatron, unfortunately, if you missed it, you're completely screwed. Just kidding. Everything I do is recorded. Come on, seriously. I know you I know you people can't show up on time. I know you suck. I know you that's not true. I know you have real jobs. I know you have real jobs and you have lots of other things going on, help desks issues and all that. So everything that I do is always recorded and available on my channel. So knock yourself out. And then uh, bottle, uh, pitfall number three is tuning the wrong bottleneck. So uh, paying attention to something when performance doesn't really matter for that thing. For example, like if you're having blocking problems, don't sort queries by CPU. If you're having storage problems, don't s sort queries by how much duration they took. And then again, one more shout out for this week's sponsor, Quest, as doing an Ask the Expert session. If you go to quest.com slash ask the experts, you can hang out with me and Panal on Wednesday, June the 24th for an hour while we answer your open questions about performance. So now let's see what else you got in terms of questions. And switch over to our chat window here. And let's see if y'all feel free to ask any questions that you want about either what I covered here or just SQL Server in general. And I'll go until there are no more questions for like 30 seconds straight. Go. Let's see what y'all come up with there. Do, 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 do. I should be playing music in the background while I'm waiting for you. Oh, I have a countdown. 10, 9, 8. Da. Uh, Mike Shaw says, do you have a class about removing unnecessary indexes? Yes, that would be my mastering index tuning class. Mastering index tuning, it's three days long. Uh, uh, Pete says, what's it like managing tempdb in Azure? It's the same as managing it on-premises, except that it can be much harder to interpret. Uh, you can hit limits on tempdb throughput in Azure, just as you would lit hit them on-premises. So it becomes a matter of discuss figuring out how you uh, manage that. Um, Surly Dev says that desk is far too clean. You don't do proper work on this desk, do you? I am one of those people who, uh, if I can see something anywhere in my field of view, it will interrupt me. So I want an absolutely spotless desk. <laughs> 
And this is actually the, the same way that my desk looks every single day. Um, this is actually a little bit more. I don't want these on my desk, except when I'm doing webcasts. Just like if I have a coughing fit or whatever, I want water here. But otherwise, I actually even move the Stream Deck out of the way so that this is all I have. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, next one, Tejareb says, I feel like tracking Azure memory usage info is hard. You want a job, right? You, you, don't, you don't really want that stuff to be easy, do you? I don't know about you, but I, I kind of like having a job. The harder that something is, the more likely it is that you're going to have a job doing it. So I don't know about you, but let's yay for jobs. Really big fan of jobs. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's uh, all, <laughs> all kinds of good questions. Um, Hecatron says that mastering index tuning rules. Thank you. Uh, Pro Hiller says any experience with Redgate SQL Monitor in Azure. I have not had the best experience with Redgate SQL Monitor, uh, so that's just my own feelings. Especially when it comes to things like Azure SQL DB, your best there, bet there would be to talk to their support people. And I'm not saying that because they're not sponsoring the webcast. I'll always give you the same unfiltered advice. Redgate SQL Monitor hasn't been able to get me across the finish line in the performance problems that I've run into. Uh, Rob, or Robert Griffin says, my takeaway for pass is a pass is a uh, for bootstrap dev teams who can't afford a DBA. Yes, or uh, software as a service companies, software as a service companies that get lots of uh, clients and they want to itemize the cost for each client. It works really well too for that. Abhijit says, between SSRS and SSIS, if I had those reporting services and integration services, uh, which one would be cheaper, PaaS or IaaS? So SSRS isn't available in PaaS, and uh, SSIS is really much more about Azure Data Factory. So if you want truly cheap, it's probably going to be IaaS, because of course there's no PaaS for reporting services. Uh, Max says, how was that loading down to test with Azure SQL DB? Was it inserts within SQL DB? Yes. Taking things purely out of memory, so tables that were small enough to be cached in RAM, and dumping them directly to disk. And I, I even tell you how to do it inside those blog posts too as well, so that uh, people can repeat the same tests over time, because I'm not going to go back and drop 20 grand for a few days. I mean, granted, I don't leave the 20 grand v, uh, Azure SQL DB running the whole time. I run it long enough to run the tests and then cut it. But those tests with that client, I want to say racked up to a three or four thousand dollar bill when I was trying to narrow it down and reproduce it to make sure it wasn't something I was doing because I don't want to look stupid. Microsoft would love to say, oh no, Brent did it wrong inside his blog post. He didn't know what he was doing. So I got to make sure that it's absolutely bulletproof before I go public and say there's a problem with Azure. Hecatron says, do you have a reference for some good Postgres uh, training? I'm a SQL guy, but they want me to take over some Postgres and MySQL DBs. Yes, for Postgres, for querying, for querying Postgres, search for a curious moon, M-O-O-N, a curious moon Postgres. And there's a really neat course about how to uh, query Postgres by brilliant Rob Connery, I believe his name is. Um, Mike Shaw says, did Microsoft didn't reimburse you for the tests that you had to do to prove their documentation was wrong? You know, it's funny. If you pull Microsoft's pants down in public, they tend to not pay you for that. There are some people who like their pants pulled down in public. Microsoft doesn't seem to be one of those. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Abhishek asked earlier, uh, how long do conventional DBAs have jobs in the market? If you look at at least how my jobs are going, it's pretty freaking long. Surly Dev uh, says, oh, they're talking about uh, tables there. Uh, next up, uh, who else? Let's scroll up a little further. Oh, Lassamat says, is it worth to learn SQL Server if my company only uses Oracle and if I don't maintain them for now? No, you should only... So here's the thing. It's really hard to get a job without experience. Um, if you have experience, then it's easier to get a job. But you don't want to go learn a product just for your own curiosity because no one's going to pay you to manage a product. A few companies are going to pay you to manage a product if you haven't had production experience with it yet. 
So I would say if you have Oracle in your shop, you're better off learning Oracle from the people around you. Even if it's not your job duty, it's going to be easier for you to segue that direction than into a, a product that your company isn't even using. Um, Gawabunga says, what's your advice on availability zones and, and replication for a, a 24, H24 and worldwide availability? That is where my consulting comes in. Obviously, you wouldn't architect a 24-7 system just based off of what some yo-yo said out on Twitch or YouTube. Uh, but that's, that's where we tend to do uh, hands-on consulting, where I do, I say we, it's me. The company is me in terms of consulting. Um, you could hire us in, we have the SQL critical care thing where I go through and analyze your existing application, what your application does, and then that way I can figure out exactly what the right solution is for you. There are samples of that up on my site too. If you go to brentozar.com, there are example deliverables up at the top under consulting where I talk about different infrastructures and things like that. All right. Well, there we go. Hopefully y'all had fun in this webcast. I did. I'm having a good time with my new overlies, overlays and all that. So have fun and I will see y'all on the next webcast. Adios, everybody. Uh -huh.